Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Morissette, uh, Dean of Faculty of Computing and Information Science at Cornell. To my right. I am Nadia Bliss. I'm the Director of the Global Security Initiative at Arizona State University. I'm Keith Marzullo. I'm the Dean of the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. So um, this is a, a focus around visioning for uh, cybersecurity. It's a subcommittee that's been an important part of CCC for quite a while. We wish our, our colleague Kevin Fu, who's the other uh, key member and the real leader, uh, was here, but he couldn't make it. Um, so what we're going to do in this in this uh, activity is we'll talk a little bit about the things that CCC has done in the context of security, um, uh, some of the activities. Uh, this is a little bit different than some of the newer things um, that are going on because Security is a really hard problem, but there's a lot of people working on it, and it's hard to actually uh, make a, a, a dent, if you will, into the problem, uh, given all the activity that's going on. Um, but after that, we'd like to open it up to your ideas about where should the security community be going. And we have one idea that came out of our last workshop, uh, or last meeting, uh, that, that we think is important to focus on, but we'd like to hear from you folks where else should we be going? What else should the community be doing and working on? So I'm going to briefly uh, just catalog a few things that uh, we and Kevin have been working on uh, uh, and then ask uh, Keith and Nadia to go into a little bit more detail about each of those. So, um, so some examples of things that we've done or are doing at USENIX, the security conference, uh, just in a couple of weeks. Kevin will be running a workshop on embedded security. So this is something that we get a lot of requests from Washington uh, to do something about. And um, uh, Kevin's bringing in a whole bunch of expertise, of course, from the Usenix security community, but also bringing in folks from Europe who seem to have a bit of a head start on some of the embedded security uh, uh, problems and solutions. So uh, if you're going to be at that conference, I encourage you to go attend that workshop. Another example of uh, an activity that we've done is, is Nadia and uh, Dan, Beth, and Henning uh, participated in a congressional briefing around cybersecurity. Um, so that's another activity that the CCC is doing. Um, and Nadia will tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, uh, another thing that we do is a lot of blog posts. So, uh, and in fact, we invite people to come do blog posts because I'm too lazy to do them myself. Um, so if you're interested in a blog post, that would be a great uh, example of something you could, you could pitch in on right away. So some examples of blog posts that we've had recently. Uh, one, I got Adam Chapala from MIT to talk about the role of formal methods in security and software security, especially in the embedded system, system space. Uh, but another example is Nadia did when the Equifax blow up happened. Nadia did a really good blog uh, about that. She can tell you more about that. Uh, and then finally, Mark Hill, when Spectre and Meltdown appeared on the scene, uh, gave a really good uh, overview of what those attacks were about and what was going on. And um, that ties in with the, the work that he does in the architecture community. Um, but it was a it was a good example of where I think we can explain to a general population uh, challenges and issues in, in especially the privacy and security space. And that post was picked up by a lot of newspapers, wires, et cetera, as a way for them to understand what's going on. So it's not just communicating amongst ourselves and with funders, but also with the general public that I think is it's useful. Um, so uh, Keith is going to talk a little bit, I hope, uh, about the AAAS and uh, um, the, the panel that we have there. Uh, no? maybe not. I can talk a little bit about okay. that. <laughs> I'm absolutely happy to talk about that. But also uh, forensics, I hope. I will talk well, about I'm, that. I'm volunteering him. You can tell we have a court. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention one last thing, uh, uh, the kind of work that is going on. Kevin, uh, if you don't know him, he's at uh, Michigan. Kevin, who's, who's done a lot of work on embedded security, um, I got called away from many of our activities for a while because it turned out he was figuring out what was going on in Cuba. Do you remember there were these attacks in Cuba where the people in the U.S. Embassy were all of a sudden complaining of headaches and they thought it was some new ultra-secret weapon that was being deployed against them. So Kevin actually diagnosed uh, what was the most likely cause of that, um, and it was much more benign than everybody thought it was. 
Um, but now, strangely, those attacks are happening in China as well, and so I think Kevin is off uh, figuring out what's going on there. So uh, he can't be with us, I'm sorry. All right, so now I want to turn it over to Nadia to maybe tell a little bit more about what happened with the congressional briefing and maybe her Equifax blog. Oh, okay. Can folks hear me? Okay, okay, great. Thank you for being here. It's kind of rough, four o'clock at the end. Cybersecurity is important. Everybody uses two-factor authentication. Yay, no, okay. Um, all right, so, um, so I guess one of the things that I, I'd like to kind of say about this space um, and I even wrote an article about this like two years ago, I think, is um, I, I really feel like as computer scientists, we pretty much mess this up, like the whole state of cybersecurity. Um, so I think it's not really fair to say that we didn't see the mess coming. I think many of us have seen the mess coming and the article I actually wrote it was for Passcode, which was a cybersecurity uh, publication of Christian Science Monitor, which unfortunately went away. Um, but it was basically, I said that everything I needed to know for, about cybersecurity, I learned in CS 513, which was a master's class I took at Cornell with Fred Schneider like almost 20 years ago at this point. Um, and it's a little bit an exaggeration, but, but I do think that um, uh, we kind of have been avoiding the responsibility in the space as a community. So we've really focused on advancing functionality and uh, uh, developing new applications as opposed to pausing, slowing down and saying, well, maybe we don't need to roll this new thing out. Let's figure out how to make it a bit more secure. And I think a lot of the attacks that have happened, certainly things like the Equifax bridge, and that was with significant input from Tim Summers, who is in Keith's college, a faculty member in Keith's college. Um, it, you know, th those type of breaches are not actually exploiting a novel exploit. Like somebody had weak passwords on the database systems, right? Which is at this day and time is unacceptable. So one of the big things that we, we talked about in context of the briefing, and Dan was also part of the briefing and I, I saw him like a second ago and, oh, here there he is, okay. Um, uh, and then also Beth and Henning, and they can all, Beth is ar around as well, and she can tell you more about it. So we were talking about the notion of intelligent infrastructure and research around intelligent infrastructure. And one of the points, that, so my, my, my topic was security, as you saw, I was very stern mm -hmm. and purposefully trying to scare everybody. Um, You're so scary. I know, I'm just horrifying. Um, um, so my, my hope for that briefing for the congressional staffers was essentially to make sure that they walked away with this feeling of, you know, we have to design security in these systems from the very beginning. It cannot be an afterthought. We can't build interconnected, um, uh, you know, traffic lights and interconnected roads and interconnected vehicles and then <coughs> add security. It should be sort of there from the very, very start, thinking about it from the very start. Furthermore, there is a significant explosion um, of uh, presence of these interconnected devices and that really needs to be addressed continuously. So a typical question, and that, that, was, really, that was really the big message. So if there was one, one thing to take away from that briefing, um, I think the transcript of that is also available on the, CCC, um, on the CCC website, is that we really need to think about it from the beginning. Um, I, also, um, I also am often asked this question is like, well, are there new things left to do in security or is it just patching? And I actually think it's an incredibly important time to be a researcher in security because you have an opportunity to identify secure protocols, secure architectures, and secure algorithms for this entire space of new devices. Furthermore, there's tremendous opportunities at the interface of human and machine because again, as I'm sure those of you who study this space know really well, sometimes the weak, often, often the weakest link in the system um, is, is the human. And I think that's something that we've been trying to communicate more broadly um, in terms of a research agenda. I would also say that at some point in your career, and maybe it's not you know, right away, but participating in a congressional briefing or congressional testimony is an incredibly worthwhile and rewarding experience. It was a little bit intense and a little bit crazy. And again, Dan can also say, uh, say more about it. So we kind of had continuous phone calls, usually on the weekend, so speaking about work-life balance um, as to you know, preparing that information. But being able to communicate without jargon 
true technical challenges is an incredibly important thing you can do as a computer scientist, particularly in context, um, particularly because, again, I feel very strongly responsible for getting ourselves to this point. So it's sort of also our, our on us to get ourselves out of this mess. Great. So uh, with Thank that, you, Nadia. Yes. So now I'm going to turn to Keith, who has no idea what I asked him to talk about, but he's going to anyway. <laughs> I'm going to talk about what you asked me to okay, talk about. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, so, um, what I'm going to do is pick up on one of the threads that, that Nadia covered, which is the human element of cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity is, is a very complex, multifaceted problem, and there are issues of technology, issues of risk management, issues of all sorts of things. Uh, but it is also something that we do to ourselves, right? As, as Nadia says, we created this mess, we should clean it up. Um, it, it's, that's an excellent way to, to frame it. It's, it's actually something that we need to think about, not only from a technical point of view, but in what's called a socio-technical point of view. Socio-technical design is a technique that is a co-design where you take this, the people, the organizations into account, as well as the technology, one not being dominant of the others. Um, uh, and when you think about how people think about cybersecurity, we often frame it as attackers versus defenders, good guys versus bad guys. You hear the phrase whack-a-mole a lot to indicate the fact that there is this kind of arms race. This is a fine kind of framing. It's, it's a perfectly fine kind of framing, but it's somewhat limiting. Uh, if we think about it more holistically, then perhaps we can make more progress. Um, I first became aware of this working in the federal government and, and helping working on a set of strategic plans in cybersecurity. In 2010, uh, OSTP came out with a strategic plan on research development cybersecurity that identified what they called economic incentives as being important. Think of insurance. Because if you can come up with ways to help nudge companies in, uh, to be able to put the investment necessary to make things more secure, that'd be, that would be a way to advance the system. Um, as a result of that, NSF started putting money into joint projects between the social behavior and economic sciences and the computer science directorates, which led to a lot of good work. And then 2016, NSF pushed hard to include socio-technical cybersecurity as one of the major pillars of the next cybersecurity research development strategic plan that came out of OSDP. So this is clearly an important area. Um, the uh, CCC has uh, had one, or actually a series of two workshops uh, looking at socio-technical cybersecurity. I was lucky to be part of them. Uh, Damon was also part of it. Thank you, Damon. Um, uh, this was really a lot of fun because we, we brought a bunch of social scientists in the room. I don't know, how, who in here is a social scientist? Excellent. Yeah. Everyone else is a <laughs> computer scientist? Yeah, okay, good, good. Um, uh, some people are both, that's good, that's good, that's even better. Um, so when I started work in this workshop, I had this idea that there were computer scientists and social scientists, which is a typical computer scientist view, mm -hmm. because there are so many kinds of social scientists um, that it's, it's shocking. And so we had to bring a bunch of social scientists of different flavors, ethnographers, organizational psychologists, uh, uh, cultural anthropologists, uh, behaviorists, get them into the room, and the first thing we have to do is figure out what we're talking about, <laughs> right? Because there are so many issues that were addressed. But several issues came out of it. I'm just going to touch on three of them. One of the ones was the issue of preserving individual agency in cyberspace. Uh, people have mental models of what cybersecurity is in the system. And these mental models are, are comforting, they're convenient, but they may not be accurate. And so uh, how do you design systems such that the models that people have, the way they're thinking they're operating and working in this space, actually conform with the kind of cybersecurity requirements that the system has. Um, this is complex because cybersecurity is complex. Um, and also it conflicts with other things that people like, like privacy, that's an obvious one, but efficiency is another one. And so there is a, a large problem of how do we preserve individual agency? How do we build these systems so people can work with them? And we decided we needed people in HCI because there's a design question. Accessibility because there's an issue of how people come to use this system rather than just designing for a narrow part of the, of the spectrum. We need ethnographers to understand. And of course, we also need system designers. So that was a first, one of the three topics that came out that I'm going to touch on. Second one was how do we take all behaviors into account in, in cybersecurity system design? 
Um, the way to think of this is, of course, you can think about individual agency. The first thing I talked about is individual agency. But there's also the attackers as a group. What are they doing? How are they thinking about the systems? What are the kinds of actions they're going to take? What are models for cyber criminal behavior? Another one is models of organizations. What do they do when they're under attack? We know what they do. They hide, right? They try to, to be able to contain the damage. But understanding what are the organizational reactions and how you build policy as well as systems to be able to work in this framework is something we, we identified as interesting. Uh, for this, we need people in, in uh, uh, game theory, hacker behavior, organizational behavior, as well as system design. The third one, which came out of left field, I've got to say when we started talking, was we invited three people who were cyber criminologists. And what they said is we needed much better data on cybercrime. Uh, we just don't have it. Indeed, we don't even agree on what, what constitutes cybercrime. And if you don't have data on the incidents, on what is going on, then you can't actually make any progress. Right? You can't be able to come up with, with policies. You can't be able to do the kind of research, both quantitative and qualitative, to be able to, to understand whether you're being effective. And um, uh, collecting this information is really, really hard because people don't want to divulge it. Companies certainly don't want to divulge it. So part of the question was, how can we set up incentives, the kind of policies necessary to be able to get this information collected? This group called for a, a cybersecurity statistics bureau, which is, of course, a, a grand idea of handing it off to the federal government, make them do it. They knew that this was not going to happen. <laughs> but at least it was a thought experiment, a way to think about it. The fourth topic that came up, and this is also out of left field, at least for me being a computer scientist, was people said, you know, we have no idea how to build the coalitions necessary to actually make progress in this area. Remember I started saying that there are different kinds of sociologists. And it's true, they all, uh, sociology is a very complex field. And <coughs> understanding what an economist thinks is valuable versus say a organizational psychologist is valuable is quite a gap. And so bringing these people together, both are necessary clearly for making progress in cybersecurity, is a challenge. And then bringing in the computer scientists, computer engineers, the mathematicians as well, this is what they identified as a grand challenge in its own right. How can we actually build the kinds of research necessary to make progress in this? So I thought that was a very good point, very one that is also very hard to address. But um, I think NSF is making some progress in this and funding a set of eagers. Very good. So um, I just want to react to a couple of things, and maybe Nadia can also. Uh, uh, one is, you know, you mentioned insurance as a mechanism for addressing some of the concerns, and yet the pricing that's needed for insurance really requires upon the disclosure enough information to actually. Yeah. So that gets back to your policy uh, mechanisms for for getting information out there. Um, so that was one thing that that jumped out at me. Uh, another was that. Um, there was a National Academy study that I sat on where it was led jointly by a social scientist and a computer scientist. Um, and uh, we were trying to use more general frameworks like risk analysis yeah. to try to yeah. reason about uh, what a science of cybersecurity might look like. And um, I can't claim that that study gives the answer. Uh, and what I think is also amusing is how many more studies have actually been done with respect to cybersecurity mm -hmm. from the National Academies. It, it sometimes feels like we're not really making progress. What, can either of you react to well, that so last one? Go it's ahead. also, I mean, it's, it's also really interesting because I, I co-chaired a study on macroeconomics of cybersecurity for ISAT. Yeah. Like, which is a DARPA study group, uh, information science and technology study group for ITO, probably at this point, like eight years ago. And one of the biggest challenges we identified is just reporting and data around cybersecurity is incredibly difficult to obtain because economic incentives are juxtaposed against essentially sharing the data. So um, I, I agree with you that it is a little bit of sad state that we're in. <laughs> it's yeah. actually even, I'm going to make it even sadder. Oh, good. Uh, yes. um, in that. We have drinks after this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. In that. Uh, um, you know about the productivity paradox? 
um, idea that we've been invested all this money into technology, and yet we haven't seen a, a, a concurrent rise in productivity in the economy. Mm -hmm. And so why are we doing this, right? This is something economists worry about. What's that guy's name who does that at MIT? Anyway. Dan Ariely? Uh, no, no, he's good. Uh, no, it doesn't matter, it'll come to me. Um, well, there's a, a similar kind of investment that's going on in cybersecurity. If you read all these reports from the National Academy of Sciences that are produced by OSTP, they are, all have a similar framework, which is they are getting ahead of us. Things are bad. We must do better. And so they paint this picture that if we just put a little more money into this, then somehow we'll get ahead of everything. Mm -hmm. right? Which and is good. So there's, this is sort of like the productivity paradox. It's a cybersecurity paradox. Somehow, if we keep telling ourselves that we invest more money, then things are going to be all right again. I mean, it's not true, right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't invest money in it. And, and maybe someone out here is going to come up with exactly the right technology. I don't know. But um, I, I think there is a, an industry of trying to right. turn this to, to, to keep investment. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting from an industrial perspective. If you look at many cybersecurity firms, frankly, they sell snake oil, you know, that yes. uh, they make wild promises and claims. They have no way of showing that those claims are substantiated. Um, and uh, somehow they walk away scot-free when there's a breach. I mean, I saw a study that showed, for instance, for antivirus software, that uh, the number of vulnerabilities introduced by installing it was greater than the number of vulnerabilities that they actually patched. And so, um, you know, you were actually more at risk by installing the antivirus. So, um, and yet, the, it's not like their marketing is going to call them out on this. Um, so uh, w another question is how, how do we as a field communicate uh, about security? My friend Gary McGraw says, well, we, we have badness ometers, but we don't have any notion of goodness. You know, how, how do you measure goodness and security? Is there a good answer for that? I'm looking at my goodness meter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you touched on it when you said risk analysis and, and the, the growing focus on risk, which I think is obviously something that is not purely technical. And, and some of the things that people have been looking at in terms of assessing risk for cyber insurance, for example, looking at what are the hygiene techniques that a company uses mm -hmm. on, on the websites and then using that as a proxy for what are they doing internally. I mean, we don't know whether this works or not, but it's, they're promising. But I think there's also, I mean, this is a conversation we were having um, earlier about, um, you know, potential for changes in computer science curriculums. Um, I think there is a culture, and I remember this, you know, I think it was, I don't remember, in high school, I wrote like a Pascal program and it did something really cool and you're like, it did something cool and you're just like super happy. You don't stop to think, okay, how can someone misuse it, right? So there isn't, I mean, and this was, to me, this was one of the biggest, most frustrating comments from the Facebook debacle recently with Cambridge Analytica when one of the Facebook's core statements was we didn't think about the abuses. And I think as a community, we have to think more about the abuses. And if thinking about the abuses becomes more natural, because, you know, maybe I would like, I'll, I'll be a little bit positive here for a second, maybe we're all like really amazing people and we don't think anything will ever be amused and we think everybody else is a really nice person out there and they will never get abused. But, you know, when we first connected things on ARPANET, it would have been a good question to ask. Start asking that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Ren. But instead we were like, let's connect more things and more things. So if it's not built in from the beginning and if that doesn't become somehow incentivized. I, I do, I will say that I think, you know, stocks are falling in response to breaches. And that's something that is new. Ah, but, no, you're, but, you're me no. yeah, it turns, out they, it turns out they yes. recover. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, there was an empirical study publicity. that showed yes. that when there's a breach at an Equifax or whatever, yes. they go down and then no. they go back mm -hmm. up. So Target went down, back up, uh, every, everybody has. And, uh, well, not Equifax didn't, but, um, yeah. But uh, it, it, the community, or rather business, doesn't really care about it enough <laughs> to want to solve it. Um, uh, or perhaps it's one of these things where we really do need some kind of regulation, right. policy coming from government to avoid tragedy, the commons sort of situation in, in terms of incentives. Um, what so, do you guys think? Yeah, okay, so let's open it up to the rest okay. of you folks.
What is the most pressing and important thing that we should be thinking about? What can we do? You're yeah. just... How can we not be so depressed? <laughs> Hello, Lorenzo De Carli, Warsaw Polytechnic. Uh, this is more a comment to what you just discussed. So I, I'm hearing a, a sort of connecting thread which goes along the lines that the solutions to problems in cybersecurity are socioeconomical, are, are psychological, are policy-based. So are those problems outside our reach as computer scientists and technicians? I mean, are the solutions to be looked, to be found elsewhere, not in what we do? Or is there a role for us to sort of patch up the situation? Great, a great question. Uh, so forgive me. Uh, uh, so I ran a center at Harvard called the Center for Research on Computation and Society. And it was exactly that problem. I do think there are technical aspects that only we have really a, an ability to take on. Um, for one thing, if you look at cryptography, you know, the formal definitions, the proofs, the, the algorithms, the mechanisms, that's not something that sociologists are going to do for us, right? So there are components and building blocks that I think, uh, same with software security and other things, we're the, we're the people who could provide the tools and the building blocks for <coughs> doing things. But there are only components, as Keith was saying, that if you could do a more holistic design that cuts across disciplines, um, you might hope to address it. I remember that whole circus uh, community, we focused on voting for a couple of years. And we looked at all the voting machines and all the flaws and all the voting machines and this sort of thing. Nobody thought about a Russian influence campaign as, a, a, you know, as an attack. And it's much more not a technical thing as it is a social thing, if you will, or an economic thing. So, um, that's, that's where the problem is holistically. I, have to, I also, my, my own perspective is that when people ask what's the best analogy of something else that's this hard, I say war. You know, we're going to solve war. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just think it's, you know, when you phrase it that way, you realize, okay, we're not going to stop war. You know? <laughs> uh, but, and, and security is an ever-growing, changing, dynamic field because of uh, adaptation. Um, so we, c we can look to those other kinds of disciplines to say there's something that we can, we can learn from it, but it is its own thing and it really does demand a, a, a cross-disciplinary uh, attack, if you will, no pun intended. I will though say that I absolutely think that there's no way we can get to a better state without computer scientists. So it's maybe not computer scientists alone, but that there's no way you're going to be able to do it without computer science. Because I've, I've seen those those efforts too. Like it's only a human problem. Well, the human is a big problem, but there's ways to secure computer architectures. There's ways to secure programming languages. There's ways to write better algorithms. There's ways to analyze traffic. And that requires us and a robust research agenda uh, that includes us. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. There's also this notion of you could maybe call it computational thinking or maybe systems thinking is what I think of it. It, it is controversial, people who do research by showing how to break into, into systems and such, is that really good or not? I'm not going to weigh in on that, except we have created a lot of jobs by companies figuring, oh my gosh, I have to figure out how to solve the problems in cars, for example. So, And that, that brings a kind of understanding that computer scientists have, thinking about systems, thinking about interfaces, and the kind of attack surfaces that are created. Okay, hi, Andrea Barber and IBM Watson Health. So um, a lot of my research in the past, um, to a certain extent right now, is being done with underserved populations. And I'm sure you've been considering these things, but just sort of to note this, that um, really considering how those folks might be affected differently. So aside even from like digital literacy issues, one thing is I think a lot of times we think that because you use your technology a certain way that everyone uses the same way. So for instance, mm -hmm. folks will share smartphones, right? They smart share smartphone device during the day, they'll hand it off to each other. So when you talk about the compute, the architectures, or like let's say two-factor authentication, I don't know, does that work if someone has the same, has different accounts with the same, you know, whatever provider, then mm -hmm. can you do that on the same phone? Or if someone is leasing, if their carrier is like Boost Mobile or whatever, and they're leasing capacity from Verizon or whatever, what does, what, could there potentially be differences there with, uh, with interventions? Um, so just, let me see here. I just want to be sure, I, I think I wrote this stuff down, but yeah, but just things like that in the background, just to be sure that we're not assuming that folks are using um, the technology all, all in the same way. Yeah, that's a great point. I, there's a 
colleague of mine at, at Cornell Tech that just started a project focused on uh, domestic partner abuse and the role that certain cell phone apps play in that context. Um, you know, so the obvious one is the find my iPhone uh, is a great way for an abusive husband to track down a wife who has run away uh, or a bunch of other things. And you know, certainly Apple didn't think of that use case uh, as, as they were developing that. Um, and there were more insidious examples from, that came from that project. So that, and that's back to what I was saying. I don't think we'll ever solve security. It's not a solvable thing, but it's rather something we have to be ever vigilant to new kinds of abuses, new kinds of attacks, um, and uh, ho hopefully develop a stable of techniques and approaches to try to mitigate, <coughs> excuse me, those, those problems. I, I think an important aspect you're touching on is, and, and of course, research happens everywhere, but research at universities usually has to be funded, mm -hmm. and trying to find ways to incentivize agencies to fund things in this space which are important but not necessarily at the forefront. <coughs> I mean, I don't know, for example, if Midler would be interested in putting money into this. They do things for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, there's a broader call that should be, exist in terms of putting focus on parts of the space that are helping the underserved. Hello, uh, I'm Oliveira. I'm coming from NIST. Uh, recently, a few weeks ago, there was a, a workshop uh, uh, at NIST organized from the uh, Applied Cybersecurity uh, Division. And uh, some of the attendees uh, had an um, idea. Um, we are facing now the era there are many IoT devices constantly connecting, and it's, uh, this number is growing exponentially. Uh, some of the ideas were, can we establish some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, five safety rules as a base that each IoT device needs to satisfy before they are connected to the networks. So there was discussion about that because the motivation is coming from, for instance, uh, uh, what uh, Wind uh, Surf shared that uh, when they were creating the internet, they were not thinking about the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. yep. So now we are facing some IoT, different types of network. Mm -hmm. Uh, so can we have these thoughts now? So what are your opinion about this subject? Yes. Great vision yes, topic. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, what are the implications, right? What are the implications for having something like this? And it is, I, I mean, um, so we recently, it's funny, so we recently uh, bought a house and it has a whole bunch of smart house things. And I literally walked around the house and disabled like everything with exception of very few things because I know that um, the communication protocols and the security settings on all those devices are disastrous and it's easier to just disable everything than to try to reprogram all of the devices. And I think that there's also <coughs> an emergence of kids using these devices um, and um, they are incredibly vulnerable. So I, I think that's a, that's a fantastic idea, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think what one of the, one of the five rules might be, you should, be, you should have an architecture for patchy Right. And yet, you know, that would be a great attack vector, too. So I, mean, I think we could have a really robust conversation around. And I love the idea of five rules, you know, not yes. not 100, but right. five. That's a great idea. So that would be a great visioning activity. Um, and but that's also, I mean, that's a really, it's a, also a really good observation that this very much was not done when the Internet was stood up. Right, it was more about the capability and what it enabled, and it enabled this amazing thing, people could communicate across the country, but they just kept adding more capability, and this is an opportunity. I do think we're in an opportunity where we can make things a little bit better. Yeah, I, I really agree, it'd be a great vision and exercise. I, I think the challenge of this is going to be that the kinds of things we're connecting to IoT are changing radically quickly, very quickly right now. And so the ideas that we have what they're like in a smart house now, it's not gonna be the same in two no. years. And there's the kinds of things you might consider in that be really interesting. Like for example, take the case of update, you know, should it be updated or not. A, a rival thing might be, uh, should everything be brickable? Right, mm -hmm. so that if, if something's been declared as- Kill as, switch, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. which is a lot easier than updating. 
and you can imagine how to do that, but then that starts running into policy issues. Who owns a device? Right. Does a company have the right to brick something that someone else has? So there's, it's really a fascinating place. And, to and then there's unintended safety consequences. You know, somebody bricks your brakes <laughs> in your car, that's not, not good. And again, it becomes an attack vector, uh, you know, that uh, mass denial of service by somebody finding a vulnerability that allows them to brick hundreds of, of uh, devices, thousands. So anyway, it's a great topic, and I wrote it down so that we'll take that back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple of other topics that we're kicking around. One is uh, post-quantum uh, adaptation. So uh, NIST should be interested in this as well. That uh, that you know the the rise of quantum computing means that many of our public key crypto systems are vulnerable, um, and if we don't even even if it's much further out, and I think it is, uh, to a world where quantum computers can do factoring for very large primes. Um, nevertheless, the time it takes to actually adjust our software to new protocols and new stacks is huge. Uh, Microsoft, I, I served on their advisory, uh, security advisory board for a decade and saw them shift, and it took about 10 years to actually shift from a uh, certain class of protocols that needed to be deprecated to a world where they were no longer used. And so uh, one of the things we talked about having was a visioning workshop, not so much on, uh, well, I guess you could actually, there are different things. One is long range, how do you, what, what are the real foundational questions around post-quantum crypto, um, and you really need the right crypto and quantum people in the room. But there's also the engineering questions of how do we change today's software to make it ready to plug in the protocols as they come down the line. And I think that's an interesting one that would be fun to get people from industry as well as government together and say, uh, this is a really challenging exercise. I'll just make one other idea and then we'll get to yours. Um, uh, Greg asked me to talk about two things. Uh, first one, the AAAS panel. It's gonna be on the stuff I talked about. And so if you're gonna be in the next AAAS meeting, please come by <laughs> and help us uh, talk about that. He also said, uh, other workshop ideas we've had. There's two I could think of, but I'm going to mention one that Nadia and I have been kicking around, mainly because her spouses are interested in this yes. as well. Yeah. Um, and this related a bit to yours. Um, as you know, we're in an era where 5G went from no one knew what it was to being rapidly deployed right now. And 5G is creating a new kind of environment, new kinds of attack surfaces. And so what should we as a, com a community be thinking about cybersecurity in the realm of 5G? There's a variety of ways to think of this. Um, one way is, is really how is 5G going to be deployed? IoT is an example of that, but there are many other, other ways as well. And so maybe there are going to be new kinds of attacks you can wage just due to the deployment, but also there's new technology. So, Yeah, a great example is the stingrays that were traveling around Washington, mm -hmm. picking up cell phone conversations. You know, yeah. we're going to have attacks like that yeah. at the 5G level. And the misinformation, should we talk about that a little bit? Sure, please. Yeah. Oh. Yes, please. That was the other one I was going to say. Yeah, so we're also thinking um, about a workshop on essentially how do we scope out a technical research agenda, so sort of around computer science and uh, probably some electrical engineering around um, essentially the prevalence of uh, misinformation and disinformation. And um, part of it was obviously illustrated uh, with the um, in the most recent election where there was a lot of um, untrue information spread uh, through various uh, social, social media challenge. And we saw a fantastic talk from Kate Starbird, who's a, a professor at University of Washington? Yes. Yes, University of Washington. Um, she sort of, she studies media. Um, and, then, and then also, um, so I recently just had a senior faculty member at ASU from our Walter Cronkite School of Journalism come and talk to me and say, look, we as a journalism researcher community don't know what to do because the problems are very technical. So there's the spread of information, so essentially a lot of work in, in graph theory and how information spreads on graphs. There's also um, sort of text <coughs> processing related research questions, so how do you know if information was um, generated with a real person or written by a bot? Um, there's also um, a lot of 
interesting image processing that's emerging as the need um, and quite frankly the journalism community and I'm more familiar with the research sort of side of the journalism community versus the journalist journalists but they are incredibly concerned about the fact that the ability to tell what's real versus what's not is increasingly going away and just as the rest of the security so sure you can come up with things like if you're watching a video and the heartbeat is not really quite right so you can identify that this is not a real person an attacker can come up with a different video where the heart rate is right so it's, it's very hard it's very hard to keep up uh, but there's there's a lot of um, interesting uh, research questions there so we're really so if people are interested in participating in that kind of visioning exercise and we're, we're really thinking about how we scope out a research agenda which would include so technical research agenda, computer scientists electrical engineers journalists, there's also um, social scientists, um, there's also a need of participation probably from psychologists because the way our brains react to video versus how we react to written information is different. So it's actually very hard for us as humans, um, uh, studies say to reject video is untrue. It's much easier to reject written text is untrue. So if any of, any of you are interested in kind of participating in that kind of visioning exercise or see um, I uh, see opportunities to bring in some of your colleagues. Please, please let us know. Um, so we're we're planning to look into that. Great. Huh. So I have a question. Uh, so he, I'm Hien Nguyen from University of Houston, and um, so I don't do uh, research in security, but I, I do research in machine learning. So I just have some thoughts from my perspective. Um, so uh, to me, like the problem is uh, involved with the community. And um, you know, I don't see a mechanism for uh, different communities to involve in this discussion. For example, like the technology you mentioned, find my location. I mean, somebody might, might have be aware of this problem, but they just can't tell the developer of the phone, for example, right? So I was thinking, like, um, if there's a mechanism for community to, uh, like, a database of scenarios where they can tell what are the different scenarios for different technologies. And then in between, we have a, uh, let's say, machine learning uh, you know, algorithm to match from those reasons, from those scenarios, back to different security problem, mm -hmm. like maybe the desire of hardware, desire of algorithms, and so on and so on. So um, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, and, and then is this uh, something that making sense from your perspective? I'm trying to, I mean, for, usually for machine learning, you need a lot of data, so I'm trying to think where do the uh, for for mapping from say the language uh, back to say uh, some sort of algorithms or some research field? Uh, I think we we probably can generate that from general general text corpus, right? Um, and I mean, as we collect more data, it will become more accurate. So what I was going to say is there's a there's a whole discipline in security called threat modeling. Mm -hmm where you um, sit down with a system and you systematically look at the information flows in that system and try to uh, determine threats, not necessarily vulnerabilities, but threats that could lead to some kind of problem. And that's an exercise that goods coding shops follow when they do the design phase and in fact document that. And so I could imagine um, you know, being able to correlate, hey, here's some code over here with this, uh, that ha it's very similar to the code over here where we built, built this threat document. So here's a new threat that you ought to be thinking about. And the only challenge, like I said, with that, I think, is uh, that there aren't that many threat models <laughs> that people have bothered to come up with yet. I mean, uh, not, not hundreds of thousands like you would need for uh, training on a typical thing, maybe hundreds, uh, right? And so I think we're a little short on data for that particular instance. But it's a great idea. Once we get there, <laughs> or or maybe there's another way besides threat models to. Yeah, was, uh, my my point was that when we have an interface to uh, the whole world, for example, for a certain technology, so some some people may have different thoughts, and they will input those thoughts into the database. Say, hey, this is scenario A that can break this technology or can be can be misused, for example. And then our task is to maybe to look into the database or maybe automate the process of looking into the database and convert that back to whatever the new techniques we come up with. I think that's the share uh, sort of uh, misuse scenario. For example, certain technology related to location can be also misused the same way. So I think maybe there's a share 
um, patterns or sort of the distributed um, misused database. So um, I'm saying like we, we, if we build such a database, then every new technology coming, we can plug in this uh, database and maybe figure out some core uh, you know, principles for how to improve it in terms mm -hmm. of security, right? Mm -hmm. so. Good. I, yeah, I find the idea intriguing as well. Um, although I wonder, uh, before I automate something, I want to know if it's doable. Mm -hmm. and, and your approach sounds sort of promising, but I, I, there's a colleague in my college, in my college a guy named Joel Chen, who's uh, looking at innovation, how can groups can innovate better by showing them problems, solutions to other problems. He's found a curvilinear relationship in terms of the problem you're trying to solve and the problem your solution being presented and the distance they are from, from each other in terms of the complexity space. And, and he's trying to automate some of that to be able to identify, he's using the US patent database to try to find these things. And so my guess is that there's a lot more than just machine learning involved in this, and some issues having to do with problem solving itself. But it sounds promising. All right, Asan Hawk, Inverted Rochester. Um, so I'm not from this area, so I have a naive question, which I'll motivate through a personal example. So I have Alexa at home, and I have a seven-year-old, and he loves to engage with Alexa, and one day I figured out he, one day he <laughs> figured out um, how to sign up for Amazon Music, which charges money just through a conversation. Yeah. And uh, my response was, Alexa, stop, don't do that. <laughs> and Alexa told me just, you know, as a safe measure, you have to go to the website with two-factor authentication, yeah. navigate the website to cancel. Oh, wow. Um, so you can easily enable uh, something sense. through conversation, but right. cancel, you have to go through a very secure site. Okay. So, so wow. they got the security right, but just flipped it on against yeah. the user. It's motivated by the business model. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. the, so the well, question and, is. And the, the other thing is you're motivated to cancel it only when you start paying money as opposed to the information that you're constantly leaking to Alexa yes. in the conversation. Right, that's another, another yeah, 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 issue yeah. on its own. Right? Yes. There, there's a reason neither Nadia nor I have an Alexa no. in our house. Yeah. <laughs> or do I? No. Yeah, I should probably get rid of mine too. <laughs> go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, so my question is, is there something we could do as a community to build for good practices for the corporations to follow? Yes. Yeah. yes. So some of these incentives yeah. that we're talking about yeah. at this workshop are right in that line. Yes. But there's also a separate issue which is related, which is how do we teach people good cyber hygiene? Okay. So, you know, the fact that none of us have Alexa, there right. may be a host of reasons for that, and you have it. I'm not saying you're dumb and we're smart. <laughs> but uh, there is an issue of how do you teach people better about the risks that they're taking? and. Uh, and therefore have more informed actions. And it, I mean, it could also be one of those things where something like that could be um, a, a policy thing, right? Because the market incentives are not gonna drive the company to prevent you from buying things, right? So that may need to be something that's legislated as opposed to... Sure. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we don't know. That could yeah. be unanticipated. And and maybe and maybe we're well. overblowing the risks actually in collecting that data. Um, uh, it's hard. It's hard to tell at this stage, and it's something that we're very bad at at measuring. Again, the the goodness or the badness of um, a particular choice in that design space. Uh, but right now, economically, we're all these companies are driven to collecting as much data about you as they possibly can, and um, uh, it's going to be hard to stop them. I mean, research shows that people are willing to give up on that privacy if there's tangible benefit to yeah. it. Like, I use Google, I, even though I know they're gathering information about me all the time, because there's tangible benefit. But and there's, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you guys don't have Alexa, but this technology is here to stay. Yeah, no, no. kidding. Right. Um, um, and, so. and your comment is good. I mean, 23andMe is, as you know, with uh, what's the company that ended up buying them? Yeah. Uh, or at least put in $300 million. I mean, this is a case where privacy is being taken away without the people actually understanding the ramifications of when they did the quick check. So um, there's a lot of interesting research in this area. And when we start talking about underserved populations, it gets even... Well, my favorite example, though, is uh, the guy on the street that was going around paying people $25 for their password. And people would just give it out uh, for 25 bucks, right? So... <laughs> Hi, my name is Omar Chaudhry. Um, uh, I work at the University of Iowa. So I, I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to talk to the 3GP people, people who does the 5G uh, okay. standard. So we did some work on uh, 4G, 
And what we found out was uh, nerve-wracking. Things that are you learn in the first security course, they were throwing away integrity, uh, encryption, and things like this. So oftentimes I asked what, why this is the case. I mean, that's, everybody who worked in security knows about this. So their question was a little nuanced. So they said, uh, so the 3GPP kind of, uh, they have uh, members from different country and different network operators. Mm -hmm. And their main concern was uh, interoperability. Mm -hmm. uh, neither privacy nor security. On top of that, they have uh, pressure from the different three-letter agencies that where they said they would need to allow lawful interception. Now, if you have any opening, what is to say that the bad people are not gonna use it? And 5G in a, so I, I know about 5G because I'm working on this right now. It's not a lot different from 4G. It, there are certain things that are better for stingrays, for instance, but it's the old wine in a new bottle. So they just changed the uh, different packet names. Uh, attached requests is registration requests, something along those lines. So it's not, not gonna change drastically. And so I don't think there are, and interoperability is a real issue. I mean, and oftentimes, uh, if you wanna do security, your bat uh, battery of the cell phone is gonna run out. Now, they have to make this conscious trade of choice. And it's not a clear, clear kind of incentive to tell them like, no, use encryption. So what are your opinion about that kind of trade-off? So uh, did any of you run Windows Vista? Uh, it was a crappy version of Windows. And uh, <laughs> you can thank me for one of the bugs, which was that it kept asking you for your password constantly. You know, that some, some you installed software, you, you did this, uh, you did an update. And I, at the time, was on the, like I said, the advisory board, and I really pushed Microsoft for much better authentication. Instead of you plug in a USB drive and malware downloads and runs, there, sh there should be, okay, it was really bad UI design, right? Um, and so I, I hear you that, um, and, and furthermore, it was so unusable that, you know, the Windows sales went way down on that particular release. So. Uh, so you can thank me, uh, <laughs> but uh, but that happens again and again. That that we naively, or I, as a security researcher, I naively think put the strongest protection in place, when in reality that causes a denial of service attack <laughs> against the functionality that you really just need to get done. And um, I think that's back to sort of something Keith was saying. If if you have a holistic design, the challenge is that. People use that as an excuse to avoid doing the right things. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how many times in that same board I heard Microsoft employees argue we couldn't afford to put in this protection because it would cost 5% performance, right? And this was at a time when chips were doubling in speed essentially every year. And it was like, come on, you know. I, I, Give me a break. So we use that. We use excuses like that again and again to somehow uh, uh, avoid it. Um, and as Nadia said, I think especially for embedded systems and IoT, we may not get the chance to change the stack fast enough to keep up with attacks. And so if we don't do something where things are hardened going in, then we'll we'll have a, a much harder time coming out. And so I, I'm a little discouraged to hear 5G is. Heading in that well, I think direction. also, I mean, right now we're way to the other side, right? So if you, Greg, push Microsoft over here where it was a little bit too secure and not that usable, now things are just not secure for the most part. And um, I think like any really complex thing, the answer is somewhere in the middle and it's going to vary for person to person. But um, to the point that the discussion that we had earlier, particularly in context of underprivileged populations or uh, like domestic abuse, sometimes, you know, sometimes people don't know what choices they have right. and what vulnerabilities they expose. Well, there was another question. Right here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm Deepak from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I'm interested in cyber physical systems, and uh, so uh, providing secure, secure 
algorithms and uh, architectures for cyber physical systems and embedded systems comes with an associated cost. Um, so, so my question is, is there a understanding in the community, a wider understanding in the community as to what should be the security uh, risk levels that you need to address? And, and, uh, uh, and accordingly then, you know, you can decide what algorithms or what, how, how intense algorithms need to, or, or what level of algorithms need to be used to address those security risks. I'm sort of fascinated with the way the question was phrased, mm -hmm. that providing security incurs a cost, whereas yeah, so not providing security also incurs a cost, No, no, yeah, cost, so, right? so, my, so. so that's, that's, that's yeah. another question. So is it, is it a binary that you either provide security or you don't provide no. security? No, no, absolutely Or are there not. levels of, are there different levels of uh, how much uh, security? You need? I, th I think it's very con context dependent, right? I mean, I really want the, flight fly-by-wire control system in my airplane to not be something that can be hacked by the guy who's plugged his Linux laptop into the USB port in his seat. Um, so there are lots of examples where it really matters that you have done at least, a, 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 what I like is the five minute audit rule. Tell me why that, that attack can't happen. Oh, they're on separate buses, separate networks, Etc. Then I'm happy, right? And I, I feel like that kind of architectural design gets eaten away by the designer who's trying to save money. Oh, let's you know, if we have only one bus, then we can save money if we multiplex it, right? You know, and and they, so they take a perfectly good design, you know, throw away the thinking that went behind it, and then all of a sudden you've got uh, an attack vector. That's that's how I see things happening. And this happened again and again, like the cars right now, and the attacks on cars um, are really just bad architectural design that could have been mitigated by very simple security measures. Um, there's no reason your entertainment system should have any f information flow to your brakes, right? <laughs> and, except for cost. Right. Yeah, except, except right. yeah, it costs. So um, anyway, uh, once you've, once, you know, if, if it's an important context, then I think you have to do this threat modeling. You have to assign probabilities of failure to those threats. You know, what, and the, and, and the costs of those errors, that's right, and, and do essentially risk management. Right. Uh, right. Um, and so, um, uh, but very few people are willing to pay that cost. By the way, I think the long-term goal for many of these things should be you shouldn't have to make these trade-offs, that the designs and the tools and the systems should bake it in. Like, why is it that all of our communications aren't encrypted right now? You know, why? Yeah, you know, I mean, there, there are ways to do that. It's yeah. expensive, and there are power reasons why you might not want to do that, but it should be the baseline that we start from as opposed to something that goes, oh, yeah, maybe we should have thought about encrypting that connection. Um, so, so broadly on this, um, one idea I heard from, actually, Fred Schneider um, was that, is, is it time that computer scientists, computer security people should start working with the licensing of certification organizations of civil engineers, of medical engineers, trying to ensure that people who are designing these kinds of cyber physical systems and things around it have an understanding of the risk that, that they're taking on? Um, I actually don't know whether a civil engineer who's just putting things into a bridge to do measuring um, whether there's some way information can leak out of that and whether they're thinking of that. Certainly, with car engineers, have gotten much better because of the cost of the yeah. risk that came up with it. But trying to find a way to put this into the certification licensing is something we ought to be thinking about. That was part of the articulation and sort of the argument that we made in the congressional briefing yeah. as well, that essentially we want to make sure that these protections are baked in from the beginning with um, with basically transportation-related yeah. authorities. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. I was, I was at a meeting sitting next to a guy from the Secret Service and uh, watching somebody else give a talk on pacemakers. And uh, it turned out Dick Cheney was vice president then, and he just had a pacemaker installed. And the talk was about how um, it was incredibly easy to hack the connection to the pacemaker uh, for over, over Bluetooth. Um, 
this Secret Service agent turned white, you know? <laughs> I mean, he just, all the blood drained out of his face and he ran out of the room. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a, we keep throwing processors and radios into more and more devices and making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. That, and it uh, just seems like we ought to have some, I, I think one way to do that is have software and, and hardware tool sets and frameworks that have as much best practice baked in as the default as we possibly can. Sure. Yeah. And that would get back to your yes. five I things, think, you know, that yeah. if we could codify those, then maybe we could build environments that automate that so that you don't have to be an expert to decide to get at least that baseline stuff in there. Last question over there. Uh, hi, uh, this is Hang Hang Tong from Arizona State. Uh, I'm not working in this area, but I really enjoy this uh, fascinating uh, discussion. So I'm just curious, like, in addition to all these fascinating technologies we are talking about, uh, can you comment on like, the role of the end users, the general public, in fighting this war of the cybersecurity, like, to improve their like, awareness or to teach them those like, very simple but potentially could be very effective like, tips or to empower the public, uh, the mentality of the cybersecurity. I think Keith mentioned a little bit uh, in the example of the Amazon. Can you uh, see more about that? Well, no, I, there's been several people who have been calling for uh, ways to teach cyber hygiene, <coughs> right, to try to frame the argument of cybersecurity not in the form of bad guys versus good guys, but rather thinking of it as a problem in our society, just like E. coli is a problem in our society, and how do you how do you teach people to be able to keep themselves clean, to be able to understand the risks they're taking on? Um, it, I think it's a, a vital direction we should be going. I, I'm not sure how computer scientists can contribute to that. I think, but obviously outside of knowledge, um, but it's an important direction. But I think there's also, I mean, I, I think there's also opportunities for. Industry, and again, it comes back to the incentive model to be a lot more transparent. Because, for example, when you click, you know, to allow some sort of sharing or connectivity, the way it's presented to you is you can either not allow connectivity or allow connectivity, and then you get better service, right? When in reality, it's like if you allow connectivity, you get better service for this, but you're also exposed yourself to this risk. And I don't see why that from a technical perspective couldn't just be exposed more clearly. So I, I think if, um, my guess is as a general public, uh, we have some responsibility to maybe ask better questions and not just accept all the agreements that come our way. Um, and maybe that will push the systems to be a little bit more transparent. <laughs> One thing I'm uh, optimistic about is using uh, intelligent assistance yeah. in helping users understand uh, decision making. So a simple example is an AI tool that tells you this is a bad link to click on. Right. <laughs> you know, would right. be is incredibly useful, and that's something that machine learning can do right now, right? And and does right. do. But um, even better would be, hey Alexa. Uh, why, why should I not download this app that is asking for both access to my calendar and my bank card and the internet, right. you know? Um, um, how do you? Or don't even have to ask Alexa. Alexa should be like, stop. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yes. or, or, but yeah. when I don't understand, yeah. well, I mean, I'm being asked to make a decision yeah. right now. and I don't even understand what it means. Yeah. Having intelligent agents that can help you make those decisions uh, would be incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really good area for future research. That's right, we're all, we're all becoming our own system administrators. Yeah, exactly. All our devices. <laughs> yes. yeah. All right, all right we better cut it off there. Thank you so much. Thank we appreciate you. it. Good idea.